Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1747. Today, something a little different. I'm talking to the Tesla of agriculture. Stay tuned. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Placitas, New Mexico. I don't think I've ever been there before. It sounds like a wonderful place with a very special guest by the name of Carlos Pereira. Carlos, welcome to Cars Yeah. Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I am indeed. Welcome to 2021. I know we're here. Oh gosh, uh, it seems like the same as 2020 right now, but it's got to be getting better soon. And I want to tell my listeners here, this is going to be a very different kind of show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that's important. Now I'll tie this in a little bit to automobiles. It's important to put the right fuel, the right additives, the right liquids, the right um, chemicals into your car, but it's also important to put the right kinds of things into our bodies. And that's why I wanted to have Carlos on the show today. We're going to tie this into cars a little bit. You'll see, but stick with us. Now, Carlos, before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing most people don't know about you? Uh, you know, as much as I'm active in business and uh, outdoors, I love to write. Um, I love to write for business, socially, but also fictional stories. Oh. Um, I've got a book idea that's persisting long enough. I might actually take the plunge and finally look for publishing options. You know, you should do that. My son is very much the same way. He's one of these uh, kids when he was young. He's an adult now, but when he was young, just read everything he could get his hands on. That's because of my wife. She's constantly reading. I mean, she devours books all the time. And I think that's why both my kids are smarter than I am because they just read so much. I didn't read that much growing up, but you should dive into it. My son's built, uh, writing his ber first book right now and has found it really a nice break from what he does uh, for a living working in tech for that little company called Google. And I think it's something you should definitely tackle and take on. And now there's so many ways to self-publish and, and put something out there to the world, right? Yeah, it's a, it's amazing what technology has opened up to us. Yeah. I mean, I can talk to people every day from around the world and share their stories here on Cars Yeah. And I think even 10 years ago, this would have been very hard to do, much less for people to figure out it even exists. So here we go. I'll give you a proper introduction. We're going to dive into what you do. Carlos Perea is the CEO and co-founder of Terra Vera, a newly launched agricultural technology company offering innovative solutions to replace conventional pesticides and increase product safety and consumer confidence within the agriculture industry. Carlos is a serial entrepreneur with a focus on the intersection of technology and social impact. He describes his company as the Tesla of agriculture. I can't wait to hear about that. And his passion for electric vehicles and sports cars is as strong as his enthusiasm for innovative solutions with the agricultural industry industry. Prior to founding Terra Vera, he formed Myox. Am I saying that right, Carlos? Myox? Yeah, Myox. Myox correct. Corporation, a technology company that traded water in a variety of applications and is distributed in over 30 countries. I see a trend here for healthy living. He is active on advisory and a board member with several early stage companies and social enterprises, including YPO, where he's an active board member. We'll be back to talk to Carlos in just a minute. But first, a word from our sponsors. Sit tight. We're going to get healthy today. We'll be right back. Did you know Covercraft offers you much more than car covers, floor mats, seat covers, and trunk liners? That's right. When you visit Covercraft.com, you'll find Cologne custom bras, Labra front end covers, and hood protectors that protect your vehicle's front end while you're on a road trip. No more rock chips or hours removing that nasty bug jerky from your grill and your paint. You'll find vehicle seat back organizers that keep everything in check, perfect for all the kids' things in the back seats, spidey gear webs that keep your cargo in your truck bed safely in place, seat heaters, cargo bars, pro nets, rooftop carriers, and pet travel barriers to keep Fido in the back seat. They even make tire covers. And don't forget their dash mat dashboard covers that shield your vehicles from the sun's damaging UV rays and their sunscreens, my favorite. Their pet protection pads are easy to install, easy to remove, and washable. They protect your floors and seats from Fido's damaging claws, messy fur, and slobber. Everything at Covercraft is carefully engineered and quality made. I've used their interior protection on all my vehicles 
for many years. And I've got a really great deal for you. If you use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21, at Covercraft.com, you'll get 10% off. That's right, 10% off. So just use the code YEAH21 at checkout at Covercraft.com. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. I found a new way to protect my vehicle. American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my orange crush. But did you know they also insure your valuable collectibles of automobilia and automotive collectibles? If you're like me, you've invested in a lot of cool automotive collectibles over the years. Those items are valuable. And if you were to lose them in a theft or a fire, well, try to get your normal homeowner's insurance to pay you what they're worth. Good luck with that. American Collectors Insurance provides you with assurance and confidence that your collectibles are fully covered. American Collectors Insurance have been protecting us automotive enthusiasts since 1976. They provided me with an agreed value insurance policy backed by a history of taking care of their clients. Give them a call today for a quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. And protect the ones you love. I did. American Collectors Insurance, classic car and collectible insurance designed by collectors for collectors, just like you and me. All right, we are back. Now, before we dive into Terra Vera, I'd love for you to start with a success quote or a mantra, some kind of great saying that has meaning for you. It's a nice way to get the inspirational wheels turning a little bit here on cars. Yeah, so Carlos, grab the wheel. Uh, Great, so bear with me. It's a little longer. It's okay. But a quote um, that I've tried to live by is, a master in the art of living draws no distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his education and his recreation. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence in whatever he's doing and leaves others to decide if he's working or playing. To himself, he seems to always be doing both. I love it. To me, this sounds like walking your talk is what you believe in and what you do is how you live your life. Is that how you see that? You know, there's a lot of ways to interpret it. And uh, there's a couple of folks it's attributed to, but it's a, it's a concept that's actually found in ancient Mayan teachings where they seem to believe in the joyous self-absorption of a task. I guess I've kind of interpreted it as if you're going to do something, you may as well love it or may as well move on. Mm-hmm. I learned this when I was in middle management at Intel, kind of early part of my career. I became a certified facilitator in Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, yeah. Um, and I had no idea how much and profoundly this quote would affect me, both personally and professionally. You know, I love it. And Covey, The Seven Habits, uh, I've talked about that many times on this show. Habit five is my favorite. First, listen to understand, then speak to be understood. Something I try to do every day here on Cars. Yeah, sometimes I'm not the greatest at it, but I do try. Well, let's dive a little bit into, and maybe more than a little bit, a lot into what you're doing. And I told the listeners here at the beginning, this is going to be a little different kind of show here, but you'll kind of see how this relates back to Cars in a way in the second half of our show. Terra Vera. Now, when I translate that in my leftover high school and college Spanish, real land, is that the trans- proper translation, how it relates to what it is? Yeah, there's a couple of ways to uh, interpret it. But generally speaking, we we were inspired by beautiful or true earth. Mm, I love it. Well, let's talk about this. Terra Vera. And I mentioned you are regarded as the Tesla of agriculture. So kind of take a deep dive into what you guys are doing there, the importance and how it relates to all of us and our good health and eating and what we put into our bodies. Because as I said, all of us who are car fanatics love to put the best stuff into our vehicles, but sometimes we don't do the same for ourselves, which is really kind of silly. Uh, yeah, there's some irony. I will say uh, often we'll see people spend money on maintaining or upgrading their cars and uh, they won't do the same thing for themselves. So agree with that. So what we're doing at Terravera simply is to hopefully help create a more livable planet and healthier people. Uh, and we're doing that through better plants. Um, If we put it another way, we're trying to eliminate some of the synthetic and often toxic pesticide chemicals that we see so often polluting our soil and our water and are often tied to cancer, uh, ADHD, and even degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So that's what we're trying to replace with something that's natural and uh, not just as effective, but we think in many ways more effective. So go a little deeper into the ground. Again, another bad pun. And tell us how exactly you're doing that. Yeah, sure. And, and then I'll also bring it back to how I kind of see Tesla as an inspiration for us. So yes. we, 
We have a technology that, that basically mimics one of nature's most effective ways of controlling uh, some of the unwanted pathogens or biological contaminations that we often see in our crops, things like viruses, molds, bacteria. And we do this uh, in, in a technology that actually is completely safe for both people, plants, uh, as well as the environment. The, the reason I kind of liken it to Tesla is, you know, it's not like Tesla invented the electric vehicles. have been around as long as uh, combustion vehicles. And it's not really that they created a, an alternative that's just potentially better or more sustainable for the environment. Uh, they created, I think, is a better product that appeals to a lot of folks for different reasons, including car enthusiasts like you and I. And so it's not enough to be better. You have, in, you know, environmentally, you have to be better in some other meaningful way uh, in order to get mass market adoption. And I think Tesla is doing for automotive, which is creating a path for better products that will be more sustainable uh, and moving the market in that direction. And that's what we hope to do with agriculture. We've historically relied on uh, very nasty, if you will, chemicals that have some pretty unwanted side effects. And one of those side effects is many times they find their way into our bodies. Let me ask you a couple of questions here when it comes to that. One thing with TerraVera, you primarily are working with agriculture as far as professional agricultural growers and so forth versus at home, like those of us at home that might be growing some of our own food. Are you going after that big market yeah, unfortunately today, one of the limitations of both the technology and kind of, I guess, our market approach is we're really focused at, at large scale agricultural uh, providers. And, you know, that's really the majority of what we get, although there's a lot of folks, maybe an increasing amount who want to grow their own products, be it herbs or food. The majority of what we get is from the marketplace and, and obviously they get it from big ag. So that's where we're targeting. Uh, that's where we hope to have an impact. And like I said, the value proposition is much more than just this is better for the environment. It really translates into better yields, better crops. Uh, and ultimately, we hope more valuable crops for those folks as they are uh, in turn able to market them as organic, uh, which we think has a lot of consumer appeal right now. Well, absolutely. When I go to the grocery store and I see the difference between the organic section, non-organic section, my natural inclination is that organic food is better because of the way it's grown, less chemicals, no chemicals perhaps. But sometimes I kind of wonder, what does it really mean other than a more expensive price tag? I, I have a sense that it's important and it's better for me, but sometimes I'm not really clear. Can you take a little deeper dive into your perception of what that exactly means? Uh, yeah, and, and today, you know, we're getting better, I think, at actually uh, creating standards and labels. But ultimately, you know, in the food place today, the organic products that you're buying, you know, are free, supposedly, and in many cases, not just supposedly, but they're verified to be free of these chemicals that are synthetic. And, and the chemicals, take Roundup as an example, it's not used as a pesticide for, you know, food but historically, but to control um, weeds. The way they're designed, for the most part, they're meant to be very persistent. They don't break down. They don't degrade. And that's why they find their way into waterways, into the soil, and then ultimately into your food. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is even when they take a product uh, that is not organic and they wash it at home, in many cases, they're not getting the majority of those chemicals or carcinogens off their food before they ingest it. It's just not possible. Uh, many products, uh, many foods are porous enough that um, they'll never get those chemicals out of the food product and therefore it goes right into their body. And some of these, uh, unfortunately, in very small quantities over time uh, lead to very big health problems. What are some of the chemicals that are important for us to be aware of that are used in big agriculture that we think can cause some of these health problems? Because it seems like, I don't know if it's a matter of us knowing more about them or they have popped up. When I think about back when I was a kid versus raising my kids years ago, they're adults now. And then today we, we seem to know a lot more or did we not know as much back then or, or what is it? So let's talk a little bit about some of these chemicals and what the perception is and the reality is of what they can do to us. Yeah. And let's um, start at a high level and then we can dive deeper perhaps into, you know, one or more of the, of the products or um, markets that we're treating but, you know, at a high level, I think there's knowing better and there's acting better. And, you know, we've probably known, we'll take again the gas uh, automobile or Tesla as an example. 
we've known for a long time that we've created a lot of emissions. Uh, we've taken steps to get better, right? We created catalytic converters, we created more efficient cars, but fundamentally when you burn fossil fuels, you're going to create some issues that are even in, in smaller quantities going to lead to bigger issues over time. You know, and I would say Tesla has its own set and EVs have their own set of issues to deal with, uh, obviously with battery production, but in general, they're not creating those same emissions and in general, they're better. So what did it take us to move in this direction? It's really market forces of price and availability and then also consumer demand. And I know I started my first electric vehicle. It was not a, a golf cart like many people might say. I actually started testing electric. I started driving electric vehicles uh, back as a college intern when I was studying mechanical engineering and there was research going on at Sanya National Labs and I had this weird summer internship where I would drive around electric vehicles and make notations on the battery efficiency. So I was on electric vehicles many decades before, and I would tell you I would never have driven one then. They were heavy and clunky and not very good range, um, and we're talking like tens of miles, dozens of miles, not hundreds of miles. Uh, they certainly had no performance attributes uh, over a gas car, uh, and yet today I just bought uh, a, my first Tesla recently, and uh, my wife and I uh, kind of bicker over who gets to drive it because it, <laughs> it, it, you know, it is so much fun. The, the convenience factors that she loves, the electronics, the the safety features, I love those. But I appreciate even more the driving experience, and uh, you know, it's just a better car. And I think the same thing is happening with crops and food. It's it's a transition, and in the U.S., unfortunately, we're kind of behind the rest of the world. Um, about three fourths of the chemistry that we can put on crops in the U.S. They're not allowed in the UK where there's a, a heightened sensitivity to not only environmental issues, but to health issues. So just think about that. Three fourths of the things that people who grow crops in the US can put on their crops legally by the EPA, you could not have if you were in, in the EU. Why do you think that is? What Are they just smarter than us or are there a lot of political issues going here? legal issues, lobbyists who make some of these chemicals, putting money into politicians' pockets to say, eh, it's okay, you can spray that in your crops. I mean, what, why, they're, why are they smarter than us when it comes to being more healthy with their food? You know, there's probably some cultural things for sure, but I do think our political system here, and, you know, I'm experiencing this in agriculture, and I certainly experienced it when I was in the water treatment industry, um, where I had an alternative to chlorine uh, for water treatment. And when I was able to talk to the Senate, to one of the subcommittees on the dangers and hazards associated with transporting hazardous chemicals for water treatment, uh, I, I was amazed, quite frankly, at the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars these large companies spend on keeping the status quo. Of and, course. Uh, yeah. Follow the money. Sadly, always seems to be the case, doesn't it? It does, unfortunately. But you know what? The, the, the flip side is, you know, consumers speak and we respond in the U.S., I think, as well, if not better than, than most places in the world to what the consumer wants. And we see this uh, in, you know, just kind of the raw numbers, you know, food and agriculture kind of grows about three to four percent a year. And the need and desire for organic products is going at about three times to five times that pace, about 15 to 18 percent. And uh, people are voting with their pocketbooks and the companies will respond and the growers will respond. And, you know, we think we're on the front end of that trend. I think so. Now, talking about food, one of the things that transportation, automobiles, trucks, airplanes, ships have done for us is I can get up in the morning and have blueberries from Chile. I can have bananas grown in Ecuador. I can have eggs that were hatched right up the road at a, a, a farm where some chickens are running around in the wild, uh, supposedly free range and not in a pen, maybe a little bit happier. I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think so. And I can drink something that was mixed in Europe and wine from France. I mean, all this food can get to us so fast and stay healthy, whereas even 50 years ago, you couldn't do that. You couldn't get food to you fast enough because it wasn't fresh. So you had to eat everything within a certain distance. The worry that I have about that is, okay, if my blueberries are coming from Chile, what are they spraying on the blueberries down there? Are, are they being healthy? Do they have the restrictions in that country that we have or the UK or anywhere else? So are there some factors there that tie into this? Obviously, your your company, you want to work worldwide like you did with your water company to try to stop bad things from getting in our food that gets shipped here. Even when you think about fish, uh, you give 
fish that's relatively fresh. It's been flash frozen, but it maybe was caught two days ago in some part of the world. Well, is there mercury in the water there? Or was it caught off of Japan after the nuclear disaster they had? And that fish have four eyes? I, how do we guard against all this? Yeah, I think it's uh, a great set of points you raise, and, and, and no question. And kind of unfortunately, as much as the regulators and the, the you know, compliance issues that we all have to deal with on our food chain, it really comes down to the consumer and knowing you know, what you're consuming and knowing the origin of it. And I think there's a trend, and I, I don't believe it's just in agriculture, although I think agriculture is uh, a great example, but I think we're moving – back away from that mass production into what I'll call mass localization, where we get efficiencies, not just by growing, you know, a crop in a certain area or manufacturing something in a certain concentrated area, but instead by distributing that and actually getting the product or the crop to be grown or manufactured closer to the end user. And not only their transportation uh, trade-offs, but to your point, there's freshness, uh, and there's other benefits, but one of the issues is you can customize it in a way that you can't do when you mass produce in a centralized region. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. You know, we're seeing it in agriculture. You know, you're seeing restaurants now that have access to technology. Even if they're in an urban area, they can grow their own herbs pretty easily in controlled environments and cabinets that are lit with LED lights that are efficient, that don't create heat, that don't um, take a lot of energy. So we're just seeing those trends where folks are trying to get a better handle on the whole supply chain, if you will, and know what they're putting into their bodies. That's the tough part. We, uh, I live in Gig Harbor, Washington, a small community south of Port, uh, Seattle, and we have a farmer's market in the summer. And I like to support local farmers and go there and buy things. And I was talking to a lady once and she said, well, this food is so much more healthy than what you get in the grocery store. And I was being a little bit of a devil's advocate. And I said, how do you know that? Well, it's grown locally. How do you know the guy that grew it locally didn't spray something on it? How do you know that? Well, he wouldn't. How do you know that? <laughs> I mean, I just kept, she didn't like my questions and turned around and walked away. But it made me think a little bit that the perception that you're getting healthy food versus what you may really be getting are two different things. And you're right, the consumer, we have to ask better questions of our suppliers, uh, even in the grocery store. Where is this coming from and who's growing it and how are they growing it and what are they allowed to do with it? Those are sometimes hard answers to get. You know, they are. But I think, again, if you get to technologies and methods that create a better product, you know, to your example, I would probably ask that grower, is that the same thing they're serving their kids uh, or the grandkids? You know, because it's one, one litmus test is, you know, we're usually more sensitive to what we consume ourselves and what we might pass on, unfortunately, at times. But, you know, I think the other piece is if you were to get, you know, let's go back to your blueberry example, a better tasting you know, better consistent blueberry, you know, from Chile or some other in international market, that's one thing. But what if you could get a higher quality, more tasty, just more desirable product grown locally? Mm -hmm. And if that product was not just grown locally, but the reason it was better was because it was grown organically or with different methods than traditional chemistry, synthetic pesticides, then you would be onto something. And I think it gets back to the Tesla example. It's not enough to be environmentally sustainable. You have to have a better product. People will buy, you know, on their conscience at times, but ultimately they want the best bang for their buck. And if you have a better product that's grown in a better way and the better way helps create the better product, then you have something, then you're onto something. It's a win, win, win. Absolutely. Let's take a short break and thank our sponsors. We come back, I'm going to ask you a little bit of a, a challenge question, then we're going to dive into your passion for cars because this is Cars Yeah, and we're going to talk some cars today, so don't worry, folks. Sit tight. But I think this was an important thing to discuss because what we put into our bodies is, is so important, and definitely as we age, as I seem to be, I always say getting older is a good thing because the alternative kind of sucks. Uh, is it more and more important uh, into how we feel and how we look and so forth? So sit back, stay healthy, put some good in your mouth today, and we'll be right back. Have you looked under your hood recently? The average car today has more than 70 computers and 100 million lines of code. Today and tomorrow, being a professional technician requires an understanding of technology, computers, and and electrical systems that are highly advanced and very complex. Cars yeah is honored to support Tech Force Foundation as our charity of choice. Their efforts to help young people pursue a technical education and a fulfilling career as automotive techs is the key to an inspired life. Through scholarships, grants, and good old-fashioned hands-on experiences with vehicles, 
TechForce, and Carja are working together to connect young people with viable careers. Join us and learn more by visiting techforce.org today. Hey, fellow inspiring automotive enthusiasts, did you know if you subscribe at carsyeah.com, I'll send you my free filler up book. It's an ebook filled with fuel filler fun and inspirational quotes from past guests here on Cars Yeah. Plus, you'll get a weekly wrap up email from me every Friday, and your name will be in the hat for one of the many free giveaways here at Cars Yeah. Simply go to carsyeah.com and click on the free book button, and boom, you're in the club. And don't forget to subscribe to Cars Yeah on your mobile podcast app, and you'll get the Cars Yeah show delivered right to your mobile device every day, absolutely free. Inspiring automotive enthusiasts, that's what we're all about. Here at Cars, yeah. Thanks for listening. Now, I always ask my guests a challenge question, some big challenge they faced in their life. I'd love for you to share one with us, but more importantly, what was that lesson that it taught you to help you move forward in a positive way, Carlos? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the lesson and then kind of circle back to it again. But, you know, I found it's important to find partners and, and employees and investors that you like and kind of getting back to my quote, you know, mastering the art of living you know, just you want to find people who share your passion and who are aligned. But then what I've also learned is you need to work that communication in a, just on an ongoing, consistent basis to ensure you're on the same page. And the, the challenge that, that I've faced, and quite frankly, I'm in the middle of it, so it's not completely resolved. Several years ago, I helped the technology company get started. Um, I worked closely with the founder. He's brilliant uh, in his own right. Uh, but he didn't have much experience or passion for running a, an early stage company or getting it off the ground. Um, so I helped this individual. I helped him set up the company. I helped him find his first customer. I even recruited a CEO to run the company. Uh, the CEO was actually a friend of mine from business school. And over the years, I've been a director in the company, kind of actively helping the company steer in different uh, partnerships and, and market strategies, et cetera. So the company is now having some success, which is great. Uh, but recently, the CEO and I have decided that we can't see eye to eye on some key issues. Uh, and she's asked me to step off the board of directors. She, I think, doesn't really want me interfering with her approach to running the company. So it's, you know, it's a pretty tough challenge. It's both professional and personal and keeping those issues sorted. Uh, of course, I want to see the company succeed, but it's really hard to let go of having a direct influence uh, on this team and this company. And it's definitely stressed some personal relationships pretty hard. So probably one of the bigger challenges I've had professionally. What has that experience taught you so far? I know you mentioned you're still in the midst of it, but many, many people run into this. I've had the same situation. And from my personal experience is usually your instincts are almost always right with what you should do. It maybe it doesn't feel so good. What are a couple things that have come up from it so far as to what you're thinking that you should perhaps do or, or why? You know, I, I think it's, it's definitely affecting how I run my current company. And, you know, I guess there's the lessons learned and, you know, I've been very selective in who I've attracted to this company, both uh, in my partners and employees and investors. And it's meant a lot to me to find people who share the same vision and passion and who buy into what we're trying to do and are just well aligned in general. Um, but I was also well aligned with this company that, you know, is causing me some uh, consternation now. And, and what I've, I guess I've learned is you just can't take it for granted. You have to work at the communication constantly. And e even having those difficult conversations, you know, are we really still on the same page? Do we really still want the same things? And I think those are difficult conversations. And I think his, myself, and I'm not sure I'm not pretty common in this, you know, we will avoid those difficult conversations, particularly with people we like and trust. Right. You know, it's easy to kind of, you know, go as we go and, and we'll figure it out. But I think you kind of have to have those difficult conversations. Hey, we don't see eye to eye or we don't seem to see eye to eye on this issue. You know, let's talk about it and, and let's understand, is there really a difference of uh, alignment or, or what is causing this stress? Um, right. So I, it's, it's kind of dealing, you know, it's kind of like uh, I love driving my car and I don't always want to stop and, and, and do the maintenance. But, you know, when you don't do that, you know what happens and you yes. pay for it. In the long <laughs> Great analogy. I like that as we dive into your car story here. You know, there's a thing I used to run a company and one of the things I used to say constantly to people and it was always communication that caused conflict within different apartments, different people or even myself with other people. And I used to say this communication is the key to our success. 
Proper communication is the key to our success, and lack of it is a reason for our failure. And it's always the same. It's always the same. You have to have those difficult conversations. And going back to Stephen Covey's Habit 5, first listen to the other person to understand their position and then speak to your position to be understood. So nice way to segue that back in. <laughs> Let's talk about your car journey here, Carlos. I know you love cars. You love EVs. Uh, tell me a car story that got you into being a bit of a car guy. Uh, you know, I've just, I've had a, I think... Uh, a great history and cars have been just woven into my DNA, I think from the earliest onset. But, uh, and one thing to point out is I love them not just for their beauty and curb appeal and, you know, how desirable they can look uh, and sound, but the functionality piece, that's what really excites me. And it's probably what got me into becoming a mechanical engineer as an undergrad. I just like knowing how things function. I like putting them to the test. Uh, so I'm not a person who's going to put a car in a showroom as much as I'm going to take a car and uh, drive the heck out of it and see what it can do. Good for you. <laughs> but, but Yeah, but for me, I started kind of as a youngster. I had an older sister, uh, and as she started to date guys, unfortunately, she was fairly popular. I was kind of right in the heart of the muscle car age, <laughs> and I can still recall being able to discern the difference between you know a Hemi Cuda or a Camaro SS with headers coming down the road uh, and I just got really excited about cars, you know, back nine, 10 years old. And then that just intensified when my parents gave me my first car when I was 16. I got a 66 Mustang. Uh, it was kind of their old uh, car that they kept around. So it was, you know, not in the best of condition, but I took just extreme pride in fixing it up and showing it off. And I never really minded it. It was one of the slowest, if not the slowest car, sluggish car I ever had. It was a little six-cylinder, not the V8 289 that I would have loved. Um, and, you know, since then, I've owned all kinds of cars, Porsches and BMWs and Benz and now Teslas. Uh, and But one important piece is I really found myself moving my primary interest from sports cars to off-road vehicles. And part of that was I have a friend, a good influence, who's raced Formula One and all types of cars on pavement. And when he saw me buying expensive and more expensive sports cars, you know, always trying to find that balance of power and handling, he shared his journey with me. And while he was an enthusiast and had raced, he really found more excitement over time in off-road racing and, you know, probably helped that he could race trophy trucks. But anyway, he, he introduced me to off-road racing. And in 2019, I was able to participate as a co-driver in my first Baja 1000. Whoa. That sounds like fun. And I, yes, I am now hooked on off-road racing. This was in the UTV, unlimited UTV category. Uh, I've since purchased a UTV, uh, which is always funny, you know, hauling around in a in an FJ that's built for off-road. I'm hauling around an off-road vehicle, but uh, I am now hooked. We're actually planning on racing the Nora 1000 later this spring. Oh my gosh, how fun is that? That's really that's really cool. You are hooked. You've dove deep, and you still got your kidneys after participating in the Baja 1000. Yeah, and, and I will tell you for anybody who's listening or yourself who's into on-road cars, you know, there's nothing wrong with the wonderful Porsche and the sound of a, you know, Ferrari uh, is is amazing, but you can't really safely test those cars unless you're on a track in a controlled environment. And when you're in an off-road situation, you can test not only the engine and the handling, the suspension, but you can really push the limits and you'll find where your limits are and where the vehicle's limits are in a very different way. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of off-road uh, vehicles of all kinds. Yeah, it's crazy. Way back when, and I lived in Southern California, I got to do a little bit of a pre-run in a buggy, basically, for a guy that raced in the 500. And he said, he want to come down and just do a little pre-run with me? And we didn't do, do the whole thing. And I'm glad we didn't because I wanted to get out of that thing. It was like, I just, I didn't like not driving it. You know, he let me drive it a little bit and then I had fun. But being a passenger, it, oh my gosh, it beat you up. I couldn't do it today. It would probably kill me. <laughs> I'm not as fit as I am when I was young, but it certainly was fun. Put a big smile on my face and, and bring that memory back to us too. How about a special vehicle in your life? Was it that Mustang or is there something else you might want to share a special memory you have of? Yeah, the Mustang certainly is the most sentimental car in my past, you know, not just because it was my first, because uh, my parents gave it to me. You know, beautiful copper color, you know, nearly original. It was also how I met my wife, or a key part of it anyway, that I dated in high school. So I guess in, in that way, it, it should be my favorite car. But 
Um, my all-time favorite car for as a car, I had a, a 2001 Boxster, Porsche Boxster S. It was black on black. It was beautiful. And I purchased it almost new with 2,000 miles. Mm-hmm. But the original owner had done a ton of things that I would never have done or thought were good cost-effective upgrades. They put an aero kit so it stood out from other boxers. It just looked different. It had upgrades to the suspension. So anyway, I, I'm uh, living in Silicon Valley at the time, but I bought the car in Phoenix. So I had the opportunity to drive it for its first drive up Highway 1 from L.A. to San Francisco. Oh, no fun. Great drive. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, we got good weather, and so the top was down. And, you know, that was exactly why this car was created with these kind of twisty roads to, uh, to show off its handling. So the, the funny part of the story came when I was almost home, uh, back to Palo Alto, but I decided to take the back roads in the mountains of Santa Cruz just to get in a little bit more driving. And by now, I'd become pretty comfortable with how this car handled. So I was definitely putting it to the test on some of these open, windy roads. And if you, you and I'm sure you've remembered doing this yourself, but when you get that burning smell of rubber, like something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I pulled over thinking I had pushed the engine too hard and I had ruined a belt or done some damage. And, you know, oh my God, this brand new car just spent more money than I'd ever spent on a car before. Uh, and I'm kind of having a little bit of my own meltdown. And then I figured out that the smell wasn't coming from the mid engine, but it was coming from the tires that were melting under all the stress. <laughs> yes. Pushing hard. Yep. <laughs> well, that's good. Tires are cheap, cheap to replace versus engine parts. Yeah, I've owned a lot of cars that are faster, but none that have been as fun as that Porsche. And uh, I actually owned that Porsche three different times, but that's a whole different story for <laughs> yeah, me. no doubt. Oh, I love those, uh, the boxers that came in, wonderful cars, driven them on tracks. I've never owned one, but I've always thought seriously about maybe getting a Cayman. Uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest, convertibles are somewhat useless half the year, but others might uh, disagree. But I love the look of those cars. They remind me of the old 550, and I like the size. The new 911s, don't make you get me wrong, love them, but they've just gotten so big. And the Boxster and the, um, the Cayman has done a nice job of maintaining the size. Here's a bit of an introspective question for you, Carlos. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a vehicle parked in the garage, not what you want to be, but how you perceive yourself as one, what would you be and why? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> yes. I've, and I've, actually, I've actually never owned one, but I suspect I'd be a Land Cruiser. Um, okay. Yeah, not just because they're built kind of for adventure and exploration, and I, I hope that's me or I think that's me. But, you know, I really feel I never want to stop exploring, learning, or evolving. Mm. And I love that about Land Cruisers. You see them in all shapes and sizes with modifications. You know, I love they're equally at home in the mountains or the beaches and, and that they're reliable, and that resonates. I like to think I'm reliable. But I, I love that they're kind of really designed to have fun with friends. And uh, that's my kind of vehicle. Well, that makes sense for what you described earlier. I like that. Nice answer. Nicely thought through. We're going to take another short break. We'll be right back. We're going to dive into the last lap. So keep your seatbelt on. Did you know that Cars yeah! is in the top 1% of all podcasts based on listenership, according to Libsyn, the premier RSS feed for podcasts? In the United States. That's right. And Cars Yeah! is the only five-day-a-week automotive-focused podcast for you to get your message into the ears of thousands of listeners daily from all over the world. Plus, DuPont Registry recommended Cars Yeah! is one of their top 10 car podcasts for you to enjoy. Cars Yeah! has experienced tremendous growth, plus your ads are evergreen, meaning they never go away. And more and more listeners find Cars Yeah! every day for their daily dose of automotive inspiration. Do you want to expose your brand to a highly targeted list of automotive enthusiasts in a very unique and very personal way? Well, I can help you. Contact me, Mark Green, at mark at carsyad.com or through the website at carsyad.com today to learn more. All right, Carlos, we're back. This is the last lap. It's a bit of a lightning round. Very quick questions, very quick answers. So here we go. What's one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes in life? You know, I get bored easily, and uh, <laughs> so I move on quickly to something I'm passionate about. That sounds good for an off-road guy. If you could have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or someone who's passed, who would it be? You know, it's cliche, but I would take Henry Ford. I, I just need to know if he had any idea of how he would change the world in so many ways. <laughs> yeah. Number one answer here on cars, yeah, uh, Henry Ford. Carol Shelby, number two. Elon Musk, I think, is running a close third. Now, when it comes to automotive advice that someone else ever offered to you, what's the best advice you've received? You know, it, it came from a startup executive and venture capitalist, and I think it applies to business and life. Uh, and he said to me, 
too much time in the rearview mirror is a good way to find yourself crashing into the next wall. <laughs> I always have a saying that the reason the windshield's bigger than the rearview mirror is you should always be looking ahead, not behind. And I even I listened to a seminar with Tony Robbins last week, and he mentioned that same analogy in a way. He said, "Why would you want to drive a car looking in the rearview mirror? You're going to crash." Yeah, I think that makes some sense. Now, how about resources? There's so many great resources these days. Is there a go-to for you that you're real fond of? You know, I wish I had something that was, um, you know, unheard of or innovative, but really I've become a big fan of reddit.com. I've certainly known about it for years and glanced at it, but I've just been amazed as I've spent time on it, especially over the, the pandemic, just how much you can learn from other people's um, successes and mistakes. Well, I tell you, the week that we're recording this show, uh, there's some folks on Reddit that are playing with the market that's causing a little bit of upheaval going on, uh, which is quite interesting. So, uh, yeah, Reddit. My kids keep telling me to go there and use that. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Now, I may sound goofy to some people, but I look at it and I go, what? what's going on here? But maybe uh, you can give me a lesson someday. That would be helpful. But the few times I've gone into it, I found it really, really interesting. Is there a book you've read that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I'll give you one that uh, people have probably watched the movie Forrest Gump, but like most books that uh, are movies and books, the books is way better than the movie. Um, but professional, there's a book that very few people seem to have come across. It's called The Goal by Goldratt. And I will contend that it can help you think more effectively. Very cool. I'll make sure I put a link to that. I'll have to get my hands on a copy on uh, Carlos's show notes page where there's over 1,800 books listed there by my inspiring automotive enthusiast, the goal. All right, we're up to the checkered flag here. We're almost at the end of the dirt trail. I'm going to buy you a very cool collector vehicle today, Carlos. Anything you'd like in the world, I'm going to park it in your garage. But you've got to keep it. It's got to kind of tick all the boxes. you got to drive it. You can't sell it to raise some venture capital to fund your your, your business. Uh, but it's the only one cool collector vehicle you can have, whether off-road or on-road. So what's it going to be? Yeah, tough question, uh, but I would pick something not for its value, but for its value to me. And I'd probably pick a, a Tesla Cybertruck. Okay. Uh, it's on my list of purchase. I've got a deposit, but I just think that might be the best overall vehicle I can think of for the long term. First one to pick that vehicle. Nicely done. You're a forerunner out in the front, just as I expected. Carlos, you've taken me on a fun ride today, and I really appreciate you spending some time doing something a little different here on Cars Yeah. Before I let you go, would you offer us one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you head off into the hills in that Tesla Cybertruck? Yeah, sure. And it kind of gets back to that original quote. And if you think about, you know, mastering the art of living and you apply it to other folks and, and hiring uh, people, I would tell folks to think about finding people based on attitude and aptitude, not education and experience. Um, I think we get hooked on people's education and experience, and what it loses is the side of what is their passion and what is their interest. Yeah. And so I have found when you align people, whether it be in the jobs you hire them for or the companies they join, uh, if, if they've got an attitude and an aptitude and an interest in what they're doing, uh, they will succeed much more than if they just have education experience. I think there's a little bit of Tesla and Elon Musk diving back into that comment, if I hear that correctly, which I love. Uh, amazed at what that guy's done. I hear When I hear him speak, he talks very much in the same vein when it comes to hiring and surrounding yourself with people. Nice, nice information you're sharing there today. What's the best way for people to learn more about TerraVera? You know, I'd love for them to visit our website and comment on what we're doing. It's www.terravera.com, uh, T-E-R-R-A-V-E-R-A, -E -R -R um, or interact with us on LinkedIn. We'd love to hear from folks, whether they're um, in agriculture or just interested consumers, and uh, we want it to be a dialogue. Absolutely. I'll make sure to put a link to that on Carlos's show notes page. Just go to carsia.com, type in Carlos, and I'll spell his last name, P-E-R-E-A, and you'll find him right there. He's one of the few Carloses on the show, so he's not going to be hard to find. I'd like to thank Alexandra Rush from the Rosin Group for introducing me to Carlos and bringing something a little different today to Cars Yeah. Remember to put good stuff into your bodies, just like you do into your vehicles. If you're like me, it's oh so important. And perhaps the good folks at Terravera can help us all do that. Carlos, thanks for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, and for sharing your experiences with the Cars Yeah listeners. Until you and I talk again, I'll definitely see you somewhere down the road. Yeah, Mark, thank you so much. You've, you've been a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to a couple of laps with you at some future date. Absolutely. Pleasure's been all mine. 
Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.